Welcome, everybody. This is the uh, Projects Meetup. It's uh, Friday, the 31st of May, 2024. This is from Open Research Institute. We talk about what we have done, what we have planned to do, and if we have any roadblocks or need any resources. And I'll go ahead and hand it off to, to Ken. You can bring us up to date on High Friday. Yeah, um, this week, uh, mostly been looking at, at the profile uh, generation. There's the uh, the TES software, and I also found a uh, something called the profile wizard, um, which can dump out a kind of a a profile that 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 you can read into that tool as well. So. Um, and just discussing with Michelle the uh, the bandwidth and the the ADRV nine thousand nine. Um, it's not really set up for ten megahertz um, directly. Uh, Twenty megahertz seems to be more like a reasonable lower bound for for the bandwidth. It's more it's more a device that's geared towards like two hundred megahertz, uh, but they support down it. Uh, 20 and I think 20 is a a common bandwidth because LTE uses that as their main frequency div divider. Um, so would like to suggest that we just adopt 20 megahertz as our um, baseline for for our channel for our channel width and. Um, Let's see. So, looking at the the tool and what the capabilities of the ADRV are, the, it, it commonly you'll see people set up like a thirty megahertz uh, sample rate for a twenty megahertz channel for L, actually thirty dot seven two because that's dividing into that uh, that overall one twenty two dot eight eight megahertz uh, LO. Um, the but that doesn't seem to be possible with the uh, the 9009. Its lowest frequency it can go down to is uh, for sample rate is 39.063 megahertz. So it's just playing around, and they have various rules for like what what fraction of um, the bandwidth that uh, relative to the sample rate for both transmit and receive, and the and there's also the receive observe port um, and there's various rules to fit the uh, the filter make the filter uh, man size manageable so I was just playing around with that a bit and it seemed like uh, choosing eight, eight one, 81.92 megahertz which isn't normally part of the that's not a common one that I've seen before but you can choose that 81.92 for the transmit and the receive observe, and then you can divide that down by two for the receive band uh, sample rate for 40.96. That met all the requirements and I was able to write out, um, it, it met all the rules. I was able to write out a profile with that. So um, I'm not sure what the practical implication of choosing kind of a non-standard sample rate. I mean, it's still kind of a, it's in that multiple range, but typically they they go uh, 15.36, um, 30.72, So 80 is not quite a, but it's, I think it'll work. Um, you know, and the actual bandwidth of the of the waveform is still 20 megahertz, so. That allows the uh, yeah all the all the parameters to be met and the minimum frequencies and so forth. So I guess we we can try that and and look at the, the waveform and see what we like. But in general, just trying to adopt and I think in general, if we adopt the LTE plans, we can kind of leverage off not only whatever's been done in this space for the reference design and the ADRV nine thousand nine, but generally we'll find other ways to leverage LTE uh, 
frequency plans, you know, clock clocking schemes and, um, you know, because there's certain certain frequencies that you want to avoid and so forth for for the filtering to uh, to 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 work correctly. So that's basically what what I was looking into. So that's all I have. Oh, thank you. Um, and in terms of like 10 megahertz versus 20 megahertz, uh, Ken and I have talked about this and, and I know that, that I've talked about this with Paul. Uh, so both, uh, uh, so our uplink is on five gigahertz and our downlink is on 10 gigahertz uh, for the baseline. And we, we do have agility up to, to 24 and 47 and so on for, for the amateur bands. Um, but the the good news is that the the band plan for for microwave in in the United States and also in in other places um, is voluntary. So the the band plan that we've tried to stick to is there's a 10 megahertz allocation for the uplink in the five gig band that we're using and a 10 gigahertz uh, or sorry 10 megahertz uh, you know recommendation uh, for the band plan in the in 10 gigahertz uh these are so these are just voluntary uh and there also happens to be another 10 megahertz available to us that's it's designated as terrestrial experimental or terrestrial slash experimental so when we're talking about going from 10 megahertz to 20 megahertz in order to to get a prototype working uh we're not running into too bad of a problem when it comes to the uh the band plan on either on either of the frequencies, on either of the either the uplink or the downlink. So I, I told Ken to go ahead and and get it set up so that we could show something. Um, I'm I'm a little concerned about the the resource consumption on some of the FPGAs, but I, I look at other implementations and other products that are using, um, you know the the seven thousand series and the ultra scale, and I'm looking at you know what these were intended to do and we're on the low end of the of the usage in fact you know if we try to target 10 megahertz bandwidth for for high ferraia we're really below what the chips are spec for in in some cases there are people who have tricked it into into going this low um, but going to 20 megahertz I, I told ken to go ahead and do that and that that we just use the same numbers for opulent voice channel usage um and if if that doesn't work for us like you know going from 64 to 128 channels uh that we simply just space them out more and and relax some of the other requirements for for like uh you know how how wide the channels are so so we can we can handle that so i, I told him to go ahead and that the it's more important to get a profile working in uh, TES, so TES, we call it TES. Uh, it's called it's transceiver evaluation software. It's from analog devices. It's the only way, or the only official way, to get a profile. The and a profile is a is a text file. It's a document that's then put into uh, your essentially your your Linux. Uh, it it has all of the device tree information. It speaks directly to the to the ADRV or the the 9009 or 9002 or whatever chip you're using. And it's a source of a lot of angst and and uh, work because, you know, this is essentially configuring the registers of the chip and getting it to work. Uh, so so that's up to Ken for the 9009, and he's, he's done a huge amount of work here trying to learn how to configure the uh, the chip. Uh, and there's there's also another whole category of problems here because of uh, what we call the API mismatch problem, in that what the the version of of TES is tied directly to the version of Vivado, which is tied directly to the version of Petalinux, which is tied directly to the version of LibIO, uh, and the way that analog devices does this is they only have the most recent version, so you have to very carefully curate previous versions, not all of them are available through Internet Archive. Uh, so so I'm helping to try to manage this um, and going, so going to a broader bandwidth, uh, which is what we may have to do in order to get the chip to work is okay. Uh, and 
if all goes well, we should have something actually working over the air with the uh, with this IP integrated into the reference design and and then booted up uh, in the lab. But in order to get it to boot up and actually work over the air, we need this profile, which is what Ken's talking about. So that's the summary there. And thank you very much for all this work. It's uh, very interdisciplinary, I would say. And, uh, you know, there's lots of different moving parts uh, and things that are not not documented very well. So we've tried very hard to, to write this stuff down. Um, I've talked with Paul about this in the past, about us hosting the the executables for TES for different things. Like if we can find a, the missing copy of the executable um, and we're concerned a little bit about hosting these uh, because analog devices is uncomfortable about them being available and only wants the most recent one. So that's kind of an open question. We need to figure out how what we can get away with. Uh, so it's okay for us to kind of maybe trade them around and and maintain uh, different copies of this particular utility, uh, but we're a little unclear on how much we can get away with in terms of like publishing them or having a repo with like, hey, here's all the versions of TES. And like I said, the one that we would really uh, be most interested in is the one that's not available uh, through Internet Archive. Is there anything else I've missed, Ken? No. Sounds good. Yeah, so the, the, there is that other wizard. I, I had to like install a MATLAB executable and it, it can kind of make some more CAN profiles. Uh, I, I guess I was leaning towards that because it seemed like uh, there's a lot of settings that go into um, that go into setting up a profile and, and basically this, this gives you something that locks down a lot of the knobs uh, and it can be read by the, the TES afterward but uh it kind of works with it i guess but it was interesting that they had and yeah the the other thing is the documentation isn't quite consistent across the you know the like the help desk or that the, they do have people answering questions um and then there's documentation for the software and the software itself and none of it seems perfectly consistent uh but basically the the minimum bandwidth uh, for for the ADRV nine thousand nine doesn't seem to be quite documented correctly, and um, so I've noted that at least as part of the exercise is just trying to get to the bottom of what's what what is um, allowed and what's not. Um, starting to get a better feel for what what the what the rules are, because there's a lot of a lot of different rules. They summarize them in various places, and not all those rules are always consistent. But anyway, that's that's where it stands. Yeah, I've kind of viewed this as um, akin to overclocking. So, like overclocking a processor is a time-honored tradition of getting more performance out of a device, and we all know that um, there's a diversity of you know when you when you when you go to make products when you go to make devices, um, there's a variation in in the silicon. And some devices are totally capable of being clocked faster, and some can't quite make it. And so when you have a specification, you usually rule out the ones that don't make the spec and then just ship the rest. But the motivated consumers have figured out that some of those shipped devices were fully capable of clocking faster than the specification. And there you have the whole overclocking community. Um, and it's fun, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's neat and, and you can get some cool things to happen with, with some architectures. So this is sort of a, a situation where there have been people that have looked into the radio chips that we have and have figured out essentially like under sampling that you can actually get the device to do to to go to a lower bandwidth and it seems to be just related to variation in the devices so officially speaking though they're very firm with me about uh maybe 30 megahertz or 30 you know 30 megahertz essentially being being what they are comfortable with guaranteeing and then the that LTE people want 20 megahertz and they they have a way to do that. So they put in some some hardware. Um, and so if we want 10, 
we have to put in more logic for that. So I just assumed that we could decimate on our own and end up with, with that because people are, are doing uh, narrowband work with some of these devices. But there's there's a cost to doing it that way. So we'll we'll muddle through. And if we have to widen, you know, if we have to look at a more using more of our uh, FCC allocation, that's no problem. Uh, what we wanted to do was comply with the voluntary band plan. We're one of the very few users on the band. So, uh, and also microwave is very local. If we, if we're just disciplined about, we listen beforehand, figure out how to not stomp on uh, some other user, uh, then I think we're good to go from 10 to, to 20, even for space. I think if we actually were able to pull it off and field something, uh, the it would there would be a, an enormous amount of people who would be very happy about this, and very few people that would be grumpy about it. Um, but we want to do it the the right way. So we'll just we'll keep going down this path and uh, and get the chip. First of all, we need to get the chip to work without uh, doing too many backflips and continue to sort out all of the challenges uh, with the TES and the profiles and the API mismatches and LiveIO and all of that. And it's coming along. So I just want to thank you for the hard work and uh, yeah, keep digging into the, to that binder and, you know, we'll, we'll do it. The other alternative is to do this from scratch and to set aside TES, um, just TES. Uh, that way is really pretty difficult. Um, it means essentially taking over the functionality from TES and and owning it. And the only people that I know that are doing this are are like uh, certain types of contractors that are that are customizing, uh, you know, essentially no OS, no no operating system, no Linux, no Petal Linux, uh, and and taking over all of this, like taking the binder and 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 the data sheet for the chip and, and writing it all themselves. And I don't think that that would be the best use of our time. Uh, even though the learning how to use all of these utilities and learning the chip is, is hard, um, that, that we, that gives us more leverage and puts still puts us much further ahead than if we started from scratch and, and did like a bare metal approach, uh, if at any point though that you sense that this is the wrong direction and that it would be easier and you say, well, I could whip this out in a couple of weeks, then let me know uh, and we can talk about it. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm hoping, have... oh, sure, go ahead. I'm sorry, just I had a question about this in the bare metal approach in that I'm, I'm actually pretty familiar with that approach. Um, if, you know, is there any reason and just kind of, I, I'm not necessarily knowing all the thing pieces here, but um, just from my perspective, I'll I'll ask the question, which is, you know, could we just have a simple, you know, simple A to D and D to A converters, um, you know, off seen off an FPGA with a, um, you know, uh, IQ modulator, IQ demodulator, if we were doing IQ, uh, you can even IQ modulate on chip and then just do IF off to a single A to D, which actually helps with a lot of things. Um, and then and then just, you know, have your mixer to RF and and your bandpass filters, right? So, I mean, it's, it, you know, hardware wise, it's fairly straightforward. And then, um, and they could be simpler chips. I mean, is there something, some particular need that's in these chips, you know, that that is, really helpful to us, I would say. Uh, that's kind of my question. I mean, is there any reason we can't go to a simpler hardware solution that has it's simpler to interface to and simpler to, to work with? And then, you know, you could put um, like a, uh, you know, soft core, small processor that's running effectively just bare metal firmware that, that takes care of, uh, of configuration and status. And then that processor could be talking to like a, a, a Linux processor that's not having to do real time work. It's just basically the real time stuff is all kind of in in a firmware um, that's running on a on a simple processor. And then um, 
you know, the Linux stack just has to tell that firmware what to do and then get status from that firmware for whatever's happening, right? Um, so, I mean, it, it's a much different approach, it seems to me, but, you know, we can accomplish the same thing and it might, and then we're not dependent so much on these tools. Um, and just, you know, like I, I'm saying, this is a bit my perspective because this is what I've done for so many years. Um, and so, you know, I feel like when we have a lot of dependencies on outside things like ADI, we run into all, all these problems versus, you know, having something that, that we have more control over. So anyways, that, that's kind of a big broad general question, but um, it, it kind of fits with what you're saying about the um, the bare metal. And so- Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, the I think the benefit that we'd like to see or that we're expecting to see is that we're able to use Petalinux and, and the environment and, and it's supposed to be very close to kind of what you're saying, or at least that's how it's sold, is that, okay, you get all of these digital chunks and in the FPGA, you get all of these op these things that are built in on the, the analog devices RFIC. Uh, from the Xilinx side, that you get a Zinc or an UltraScale or an UltraScale Plus. Um, so, so the promise is there and the advantage is seems to me be pretty clear uh having some experience with Petalinux, it's it's really the best of the the big three uh, so the you know the the upside seems to be there and the downside is these uh roadblocks that we've hit um in the learning curve so the like the alternative is to just go full custom and say okay we're going to just pick the the building blocks and then we're going to pick the processor and then we're going to directly interface with that we could do that too um there's there's a that's a very compelling and clear clear argument um the, the reason that we kind of picked this sort of development uh, station approach or dev board approach with these particular products like xilinx and adi uh, was because uh it looked like we would get the advantage of like being able to step up quicker and and to get to a, a working uh, you know prototype that we that that we sort of believed and drank the kool-aid and said okay yeah it looks like it looks good to us um and the uh, kind of my my instinct is that it's our fault that we just don't have we haven't you know tried hard enough learned hard enough read hard enough the feedback i've gotten is that no that's not exactly entirely true uh that this stuff is uh is difficult and and everybody's having a lot of trouble with these products uh and we're not alone and and the the feedback i got directly from for well from matlab and from from adi both was wow if you guys could figure out how to work and publish it then that will that will make lots and lots of people have very happy <laughs> so, yeah, so I, mean, <laughs> I realized like kind of, oh okay i get it you know <laughs> you know, come from a, a, a different direction then uh I mean, because yeah, that's all understandable. I mean, then the, then how much do we want to support ADI? And maybe we do. I I don't. That I guess that's not something. You know. Right. Like, how much do but, we want to do their work for them? Really right. is Be because you know my experience about vendor lock in is you know it it, it creates other problems um, versus having something you own and control, and and then you know so then you know if they do new versions and then. You know, things don't match up. You, you create a whole nother round of work to reintegrate with whatever new thing they're doing, right? Versus being able to maintain something that you've put together. I mean, so yeah, again, from my perspective, you know, the mode I've been working on for thirty years, twenty-five plus years, um, you know, it, it's that architecture and you know the way we've interfaced with you know external devices is served us well. Um, you know, in that we're, you know, I mean, it means we always have to have somebody to maintain our firmware and maintain, you know, um, we need a software team and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, we're in a position to do that um, where, but, you know, it seems like with ADI, you're still kind of, my sense I'm starting to get is you're, you're kind of still in the same position. You still need somebody to maintain that and understand it. Um, so, Anyways, it's just kind of an interesting thought, you know, how, where it becomes, 
it, where it's really being more of a roadblock than um, helpful, right? I mean, yeah, they have all these neat things, but they're so hard to use. Yeah, it's been unexpectedly hard. It's it's never really what you expect to be the the difficulty that turns mm -hmm. out to be the difficulty, and definitely the API mismatch problem. Once it sank in, and and after taking a tire iron to the dumpster fire and speaking in person, like at IMS, uh, you know, and, and having multiple conversations and multiple attempts to and, and getting the lay of the land was that no, uh, we won't give you the version of TES that you need. And I'm like baffled at this. So that's a significant turnoff. Um, and it, it balances out all of the promise and the genuinely good part the capabilities that it has. So yeah, we could, we could dump the, you know, the sort of the top heavy approach, like, okay, you, you know, accept all of the tools and accept the framework and accept the OS operating system solution or Petalinux, which works really well. There's lots of good things that are going on with that. So let us do things in the lab and do the demos that we've been able to do. But the 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 bed sores from from these companies are significant. And it's not just us. Like we've we've been able to summarize and 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 understand and kind of like we've weighed and considered and observed and we've come up with the with the conclusion that it's borked and it's on them to fix it and they won't so now it's on now the ball is back in our court um so we either muddle through and figure it out and ken has been and paul has been and i have been and even you know other people to lock and ed and a number of people have made significant progress here um but it's at what cost so if we want to approach this from from like okay fine we'll take your chip but we'll handle the the configuration of the chip that we're going to basically program it from scratch i think we're capable of doing that we're we certainly are um but we would only do that if we could if we got like a clear uh if the hysteresis curve of pain was was totally clear uh and that's a tricky thing to call because it's always uh you know, you're tempted to kind of believe the 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 hype and the promise and and the good demos and uh, you know the things that it that it abstracts for you. Uh, but we're really we the what? Which chip are we talking about again? Oh, all, the ADI. It, basically, the nine thousand nine, nine thousand two, ninety three seventy one, ninety three sixty one. That whole that whole family of chips the, from analog devices. So the RFIC family. All uh, TES is required for all of these. The same problems with the API mismatch in all of them, to a greater or lesser extent. Um, yeah, I, and then I, matching I mean, them up like, with a Xilinx, Xilinx FPGA. I mean, I look at this. What's in this chip? And this this is all easily done digitally in an FPGA, and then just have a simple A to D off chip, or D and D to A. Yeah, it is. There, I mean, there's nothing here that's that's you know it, it's. Um, I mean, I guess that's just my perspective. I, I, I guess I'm not, I'm not necessarily seeing what, what, what the big advantage of these chips are. But again, I, that's just my perspective. I'm not saying there's not something great about them. Uh, no, the, the, I think the advantage would be is the promise that is repeatedly presented. Like, um, you know, you, you go in, you walk into this, you configure it, you get, you boot pedal Linux up, you, which takes. A motivated person that had it all together with all of the the right, you know, tools and licenses and everything. Within a weekend, you should be able to get a a really very capable system up and running, and that can actually happen, but only if you can comply with all of their assumptions. So it's right. one size fits almost oh. everybody. And if you have to approach it in any different way, and you absolutely have to, because there's at least three different companies involved and each have their own opinions about how their tools fit together. So, you know, yes, it's, a, it's such high cue, I guess, for lack of a better term. The selectivity on this achievement is uh, is so narrow that even even organizations like us that are very flexible and can comply and, and have contributed back value to all these companies in terms of like, you know, giving them very honest reviews, sharing our work, answering lots of questions, attending, you know, getting getting called uh, in meetings, 
walk, you know, trying to do whatever it is that the documenting things that aren't documented, all of that, even with all of this effort, um, not being able to like slam dunk uh, a digital design, the digital designs that we want to in the way that we were kind of sold would happen. That's very informative, <laughs> you know, like, so yeah, I think uh, we're game. Uh, if we, I really like Xilinx. I, I like the FPGAs and I'm comfortable with their approach and the availability and know a little bit about the pricing. Um, I don't know much about RF hardware choices. I, I know enough to, to know what to choose for. Um, I'm fairly confident that we could lay out a board that would work, like that we can find people that would know how to, to lay out uh, a microwave, a digital communications board uh, of a 1U-ish format that would be useful for, for space or terrestrial. So those are things that we can do. Um, it's just a question of, have we exhausted this line? You know, the yes, go with the go with the OS approach, you know, Petalinux or whatever, um, using their tools and and complying with what, what they want us to comply with. And it, it, at some point we have to say, this is this is no, a no go. Like we cannot get it to, to work for, for the amount of effort. Like, yes, we can, but again, at what cost? Uh, you still wanna have something in the tank for all of the programming, you know, the processing side. And that's kind of the thing is that Live IO is very powerful, and this this is already there. We we already have a number of people that are comfortable uh, coding, like in Vitus or whatever, using or just straight C using Live IO calls in order to order the the transceiver around. And so it feels like we're not pulling our weight on this on the platform side to get this up to snuff to figure out how to configure the chip in using TES or whatever in order to get it booted in the lab and so that the we can make rapid progress on the on the processing side but then when you go over to the processing side as paul probably can can explain better than i then you run into these weird limitations from from live io um that are kind of unexpected and the the starting point that you get is a streaming demo that makes no sense because it sends zeros and we looked at this a year ago and we went, why are we sending zeros? That doesn't help you in the lab. Why are we sending zeros? This is like the least useful streaming demo for transceiver. It seemed very weird. Um, and that's it. That's just, that's all you get is this one demo. So it's like a hello world that doesn't really actually print anything to a console. That that was that was how I viewed it. I don't know. I'm I'm very motivated to to get this working um and if the tools that we've picked uh and the approach that we have is flawed in any way or not flawed but just not really going to give us the traction that we need then then backing up and and saying okay let's uh, let's approach this with the with building blocks that we directly control uh i think just, would make me feel be better not worse yeah. from a somebody a perspective of having to deliver to customers and have customers be happy and able to service customers. And this is a bit different position, but I would just say, you know, from an engineering perspective, I, this has served me well from, you know, my career. And that is, you know, having a robust system, right. Uh, where in, it takes effort in engineering to make a robust system and, Again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't go the ADI way. I'm not. I'm just thinking out loud a bit here, and and maybe offering a perspective. And that is that whether or not we can make it work, it just sounds and feels really brittle and not robust. And that they're going to make a change in a year to something, and everything's going to break again. And then it's going to be dependent on them to fix it in a way that works for everybody. <laughs> I mean, just, it, it just feels like this is, it, this will be a continuing problem. And, and the result is that it's very difficult to make a robust solution. Um, yeah. When, as soon as you depend on someone else, then your resiliency goes down 
and maybe your maneuverability or your adaptability or your capability goes up, but you will always be giving up the resiliency and consistency and the picking that balance is, um, is our job, you know? Um, so I, I think your, your advice and perspective is extremely, uh, timely and, and, ex and very, very valuable. And we have experienced, uh, at least one of the things that you're talking about with that, they will change things, not just with the TES, like, oh, there's a new version of TES. Oh, by the way, we are now only compatible with Vivado 2024.1. And you're like, what? Well, excuse me, your own products require us to use 2020.2 in some cases and earlier versions. Like you have an internal schism and they they have no explanation for that other than, I'm so sorry, our teams just don't talk to each other, which is a quote from their, their folks at IMS. But we've also <laughs> seen a major change in the live IIO. So there's a 1.0 to 2.0 breaking change in the live IIO. And live IIO or input output or industrial input output that's really cool it's like exactly what you want to see this is a great library that serves great purposes and you know even the 1.0 clunky approach to sdrs made sense to me after you know you muscle pass the gag reflex and get the learning curve under your fingers like okay got it but the 2.0 is not compatible whatsoever and we're right in the middle of them changing it and so you you have this this Right now, you have like people from ADI saying, "Don't use 2.0. Go back. Don't do it." You know, but then you have the marketing people saying 2.0 is the only way to go and move forward and and change it. So I don't know which one are you going to believe. You know, the you can flip a coin or you know. So so what you've talked about is is actually happening right now with the with the chip. So yeah, I think this is a this is. We should probably uh, seriously weigh and consider what we're doing and look at all of the progress that we've made, which is good. Uh, the demos that we have, which is good, uh, but it's not all Maybe wasted. We, they, you know, we could potentially consider like a parallel approach, keeping this going because there, it's useful. Maybe we get, you know, and maybe it all works out and that's great. And but we could have a. A parallel approach that's kind of the other way but you know obviously you have to have enough people to to work on it but i mean that yeah that could be something if we had people interested you know i kind of am to be honest um we you know we could maybe have a parallel approach that that it's not so dependent on them as well and yeah well said and then you, you kind of end up maybe well i mean you have two different things but you you, you you kind of get the best of both worlds in a way. You know, they may not be mergeable, but at least you have the ability to leverage things that they have, but then you have something else that, that isn't going to break necessarily when they do something. Right? right. And we already have all this equipment in the lab and we can already, already directly address these chips in the lab. We don't have to use all of this stuff, uh, these frameworks or, or APIs or, uh, or necessarily use Petal Linux, although it'd be really great to use some sort of Linux, <laughs> you know, and to use LibIO. Um, that would that would there's lots of lots of wins there. Um, so I don't know. It sounds like I, I have a feeling that Paul probably has a lot of comments about this or some 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 input. So so Paul, if you if you'd like to take the floor and talk about these sorts of things and address them, please do. Well, I don't have uh, a lot of background in this field, but what I am seeing is that the TES software is is not optional because there's no documentation at a bare metal uh, level. If you want to go program that chip to do something like what you could do with a profile in TES, it's not just there's no bad documentation. There's no documentation, as far as I can tell. Well, those um, regist like the register maps and stuff in that in the data sheet are not what we need. I there are a bunch of registers that are called out. Yeah, there is. is there enough information there to use them? And given that their official approved approach is to use TES to configure the registers. And that 
um, even the official approved approach doesn't work very well. Um, is not very well documented and is hard to understand even for people who know what they're doing. I'm extremely skeptical that we'd be able to get um, a bare metal approach working without using TES. So I just, my comment would be, let's not use that trip. Uh, like, um, I, I'm sympathetic to that approach. I, I don't, I was not involved in, in the initial decision to choose this chip. And I'm, I'm, I've never been quite sure that I understood why this was the right chip. And, but I don't know that it isn't. I, I just don't know the, the choices. Um, the more we run into these weird roadblocks, the the less I'm convinced that it is the right chip. Yeah, it was a mainly a choice for, from Wally Ritchie and Thomas Perry. Uh, and because it's a, a significant, it's like a market leader. So anything that we wanted to do and microwave digital, it's a, a at least a decent choice. Um, and because of the, the uptake in, in software defined radio, like now I guess you could back up and say the, the real ADI winner here is the 9361, the one that's in the Pluto SDR. That one seems to be so broadly used and those products are still the go-to products over and over again. Um, so, I mean, go look at in any SDR that anybody's using in the space, and it's probably going to have a 9361 in it. And that's one of the reasons why we picked the 9371, um, which turned out to fail uh, in the market and is now, I would say, barely supported by ADI. That's why we switched to their uh, new chips that, that did get uh, uptake in the market, the 9009 and 9002. However, the markets for those are commercial mobile devices for the 9002 and base station devices for the 9009, not SDRs. And so the nice things that happened with the 9361 were because the market took, you know, the SDR market sucked them up. That's my guess. And anyway, that's, but that's why we went with the, the 9371, because at the time, Wally and Thomas viewed it as the rightful successor to the 9361, which we were already getting kind of the, the signs and and the the communication that this is gonna be end of life, you're you know, the, and and you know at this point that's five years worth of telling us that the ninety three sixty one is is dead and gone with it still being in production and still being available for new designs. So what we what we knew five years ago when you know four or five years ago when the decision was made and what we see now are two different things, and adjusting is a sign of intelligence. <laughs> You know, we we can adapt to to the things we take the things that we've learned and the the technical expertise that we've developed and and I think that we can, uh, you know, if we need to make a decision on changing the way we do things, that we're they're fully capable of doing that and it will it will be of great benefit. Anyway, that's that's why we chose it. Um, I think, and, yeah, that's 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 a good background. As people coming from the ham radio end of things we're we're stuck taking the trickle down technology and this has become more and more and more true as the technology races forward i mean we don't design our own vacuum tubes we don't design our own transistors we don't design our own anything and as the the anything gets more and more complicated and the needs of the commercial users uh, so far outstrip anything that we are ambitious to do um yeah, I mean, essentially, the Hyperia is a non-terrestrial network system. We have nailed the 5G NTN uh, design pattern because it makes sense to us and it makes sense to the 5G NTN people. So it's, it seems to me that the products that, that are being developed for 5G NTN would actually be something that we could leverage. But because of, like you say, the complexity of it's a system on a chip it's going to be an SOC, it's going to be big iron, you know, uh, it's going to look like an, an ADRV, it's going to look like a zinc, it's going to look like an ultra scale, that sort of stuff. So we are kind of stuck with learning, like uh, adapting their frameworks and, and, and learning what they learn up to a point. So when it stops becoming of any benefit to us and the disadvantages and the pain grossly outweigh any benefit, then we reserve i think we should totally reserve the right to back off 
and modularize it intelligently and, and attack it, it from that point of view. It, and it doesn't even meet all the requirements, right? If we're in a ten, if we have a ten gigahertz downlink, is that what I heard? Yes, we um, we have so a it, it, ten it gigahertz also, downlink allocation for space. Yeah. So it only goes to six anyway. So it's that's like, right. We still need RF hardware to make that happen. Right. So if you need that RF hardware, then then this chip in that particular application isn't buying you much, right? Correct. You, um, because yeah, it's not an integrated solution in that at that point. Correct. So I mean, I no, guess it, that you it, want it doesn't integrated solution. all our use cases. Um, in a way that we don't need more hardware for the for those other use cases. So if if it was modularized, you could have something that potentially, with you know swapping components or something, could address all our use cases. Yeah, that's true. I think if we had the, and I think at this point we do have the confidence in our community to to tackle the design uh, without the, I'll say training wheels of of a dev board, you know, turnkey approach. Um, I'd say five years ago, we didn't. We we were confident enough to be able to program these chips. Uh, and that assumed that the programming of the chips was documented and supported and made sense. And we weren't constantly getting tripped by stuff that doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, like the API mismatch problem or the lack of documentation for getting your stuff integrated or all the other problems that we've defeated, you know. So now I think that we, we do have um, uh, a, a, an increased capability in the community and that I think we can uh, basically take over uh, more of the uh, authority, you know, for the, for the design that we, we we see a path forward um, that isn't just through a turnkey approach uh, or a dev board approach, uh, prototyping on on their platforms and and accepting all of their uh, baggage, which, you know, it's, it's it turns out it's more substantial than than we expected. If you look at some of the history of this uh, over the last I don't know decade or so, the the giant leaps made forward have been by taking an off-the-shelf device and ignoring most of it and using it in a, a very small subset. The RTL-SDR is a TV receiver chip, at which we use as a, a dumb A to D converter almost always. Um, most, like 99, I'm sure 99% of Pluto users are using it as with off-the-shelf firmware as basically an IAO A to D converter or DA if they're transmitting with it, which is probably even a smaller chunk of the people yeah even the GNU radio people have made only hesitant and not completely successful steps into actually using the complexity of the the fpga integrated with the the chip yeah it basically does decimation for for them and that's it yeah so maybe this is maybe this is the right answer since this works works for so many people um, that we need to find a way to to uh, like disregard the complexity that that we don't need or that we can somehow work around use use as little of the complexity on the chip as possible. Yeah, instead that, of trying to use more of it. That's sort of what I was getting at with with my possibly erroneous assumption that we actually do have a register listing for this chip. Like we have it sitting in the lab, we can. And the only thing that really limits us is the literal copper in the <laughs> in the dev board uh, PCB. And we know some of those limitations. Like there's some things that simply cannot be hooked up, but that's true of any board. But we have access to these chips. So we have the, we have, do still have a 9371 uh, now not connected, but we have a 9002 and a 9009. And Ken is probably the best person to tell us like in, in all the documentation that you've been going through, you know, there is this no no OS solution that is supported on engineer zone. And in those cases, people are programming with like programming essentially a bare metal design. Um in in 
so I guess my question is to Ken, like in your mind, do, do we have access to the, to the, to the device in a, a way directly? Like, can we program it directly? Can we write some code and get it to do tricks? Um, or, or is that not? You want to answer? Um, I mean, I, I'm impressed with the, I, I think there's issues with any tool chain. I, I think if you want to have like a widely deployed um, accessible platform, you need a, something like the, the reference design. So I think we should keep trying to, to go for it. Um, words and all, but I don't know. It's like you can migrate away uh, towards a more uh, less flexible platform, I think, at, at some point. But yeah. Okay, so you're kind of in favor of continuing to try to work with this and see. Yeah, oh shoot. Was my mic off there? I'm not sure, but no, we heard you. Anyway. Who's muting me? No, I, I, I think there's going to be warts with any, any approach, and this seems to be a fairly capable platform. I, I would hesitate to move away from it. I guess is what my general take on it would be. Yeah, I agree that it's capable. Um, I guess the the thing that I'm concerned about is like the the weird, you know, difficulties that we have no control over. That's I think that's what bugs me the most. Like as a stoic, it's like, okay, you should be indifferent to the things you cannot control, um, and we have no control over over. A lot of the things that the company provides or doesn't provide and the api mismatch and the other troubles with the framework um mean that we cannot uh put you know slot a does not go into tab whatever like i'm not sure what other companies are doing it, I'm, I'm completely baffled at their their approach to providing uh you know, software and and answers and the and throwing everybody into a community forum for support is so 1998. Like that's <laughs> this is we not a way to provide like technical support, but they that's where you have to go is engineer zone. Do they, do they? Well, I would say to to suggest two things: a company with any significant volume will have an AE from ADI talking to them and working them through. So yeah, it's just. It's just us, not <laughs> us hobbyists then, or low volume folks, right? That end up in engineer zone. Um, it, and I think I had another point, but it ran out of my head. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so I mean, the, the people that have, well, that way, I guess it was a question. Do we know, you know, how many of these are selling? I, I, I mean, Oh, it's an excellent question. We we know if, relative if volumes. Lot, then, then somebody's figured it out. But if they're selling a lot to high volume customers, then they, you know again the high volume customers are going to have factory support. Um, and if there's and if they're selling, but if they're selling a lot to small, low volume or or you know, I don't want to say hobbyists, but I mean to to low volume uses, then then somebody else has figured it out too. Um, I mean, it, yeah, that's that's information that's difficult to come by. But yeah, maybe, we we have a little bit them. of a view <laughs> into this because we've actually provided a lot of support to um to a variety of customers, acad both academic and commercial, on through Engineer Zone. So we get DMs 
based on our questions and and reports and and what our interaction at engineer zone and i've been able to help people figure out how to use the chips and they've gone to our markdown documents in our repo and the, and the walkthroughs of like how to use the fpga how to get how to go from nothing to getting to talking to ordering it around on vitus that whole walkthrough for how to use fpgas i've gotten a lot of fan mail the recent work on how to integrate your ip into their reference design like oh wow this is the first time it's worked um our walkthrough on on how to get uh uh, for the 9361, it's a slightly, the Pluto, it's a slightly different process than on any of their other chips. And once we, you know, there is a working like example on the web, but if you can't find that, then ours shows up. So it's weird um, that we've actually been able to provide some significant technical support to people that are not getting answers on engineer zone and not getting answers for, they're not a high volume enough customer. We know that the 9371 didn't get enough volume in order for them to support it really in any way. We know that the 9361 did, and we know that the 9000 series, the 9009 and 9002 are at least uh, successful enough to where they're being supported by uh, by application engineers, but they're not talking to us because all we've ever bought from them are dev boards. So that's <laughs> uh, the actual like customer support when you open a ticket, we've had a very interesting experience there. Uh, where we confirmed that there wasn't gonna, there isn't any plan to, to provide any documentation on the process of incorporating IP into the reference design. And they have a big plan to move everything uh, from their wiki on their own website to GitHub. So they're gonna move all of their documentation to, to GitHub and it's gonna take a year to do that. So all of the documentation that we currently have access to in the wiki is gonna be in flux. Uh, and may or may not make it intact over to to GitHub, uh, essentially GitHub.io, the the GitHub web pages. So that's that's what we know. Uh, so we can see that the like the nine thousand nine and nine thousand two actually do have customers where the ninety three seventy one did not, and we we can see the results. Uh, and you can see the traffic back and forth with people getting questions answered, and we can see the no OS people actually are probably the majority. Those people keep showing up and asking questions about, you know, very drill down into the details. Like, okay, I have this problem where the kernel uh, buffers are misbehaving, or I have a gap, or a timing error, and I and I'm baffled. And and usually Travis responds with some sort of, you know, have you tested this? Can you dump that? Can you run this command? Or can you can you tell me what you have configured for this or that? Most of the time, they seem to muddle through and find the answer, uh, but there are a lot of unanswered questions. So people will post these what sound like deal breakers or blockers, and no one responds. Um, and that bugs me because that shows that there's people that have gotten pretty far into a design and discovered some sort of timing error or uh, some sort of misconfiguration, and they're stuck and they're asking for help and they're not getting it. And if this is the best game in town, like it's a very capable chip uh, and and it's not a bad bet. But if this is the best game in town, I'm not sure that we're going to do any better at Intel, at least on Mastodon, sniffing around and looking at the, the next competitor. Uh, not not a great, not not a slam dunk there either with, uh, you know, it, Intel being kind of famous for deciding that they're simply going to shut down an entire division or with no essentially no notice um so some of the same concerns that we have you know like i mentioned the the live iao uh breaking version change no backwards compatibility don't, we'll let you know when we're done <laughs> so you have that in from intel and spades um i don't know i'd be kind of i'd be kind of uh i'd be totally supportive and would dive right into if we wanted to to back up and say we wanted to do bare metal, no OS design and code, uh, you know, from from that, like approach it from that perspective, I'd, I'd be very interested and supportive. If, if we all kind of, if we can make the call that we've tried enough of this approach, the higher level approach, um, using their tools and their framework and and following the, their rules, uh, 
I mean, the no OS is still their rules too. They still have lots of guidance and walkthroughs and and use this and don't do that. Um, so so we would still have to embrace that uh, and use their documentation. But that may be the better bet for us if we're more inclined to kind of approach computing that way. Um, that that may result in faster progress for us. I don't think the OS is what's getting in our way. It's it's the layer of uh, TES that's really a problem. Um, well, can, we the avoid, open source can we avoid that with the, the essentially the no OS approach? Like, do we uh, we get to avoid TES, right? Uh, could you use TES and just and you know pick a profile and capture the register configurations? Yeah. And then you could and then you could use those, you know, directly. I mean, you, you use those without using TES then? The, the profile, it depends. So that's a really, really interesting question. The For some of the chips, the profile is completely human readable. It's like a, I don't know, Paul, correct me if I'm wrong. It's like a, a XML file that's produced. Um, so you look uh -huh. at it and it- In a couple it, of different formats. Yeah, it's a couple of different formats. So they've, and none of the formats are compatible. Then at some point uh, with some of the chips, they decided to split the profile or what they're calling a profile into two things. One of them was human readable. And yes, the configuration for the for the particular registers or some sort of weird macro in XML was created. And then they had a binary file and it's a firmware file for the zinc, uh, for the ARM. And this binary firmware file binary blob so you know at some point they kind of said ah we see what you people are doing and we're going to make it we're, you know essentially we're going to go ahead and obfuscate the settings for the for the arm and so and then so i talked to people on on mainly on mastodon but also on twitter and they're like so we looked at this too and it's actually the same file so there's not a lot of changes so if you can get an if you get an old version of tez if that's all you have that the firmware file will actually be the same. So you're, you're, it doesn't change uh, with each particular one, but like, wow, what a crapshoot. So, you know, I have, it's like a roulette wheel. Okay, so will this firmware file work? And will it work for 99% of the time and then give me some sort of, you know, uh, you know core dump? I, so that's kind of the, the situation with TES output is that they will just simply change the format the XML stuff will be in a different order. Uh, it, it's incompatible profiles. However, um, I had at least one person on LinkedIn say, just sit down with it and take the data sheet and match everything from the profile and and have a master list of like how what it was, essentially like what you're saying, a translator to take, okay, here's this particular XML from this particular TES and here's all the settings. Here's what you wanted. Here's what you got. Here's the data sheet. Now here's what it really did to the chip. Okay, you know, I that 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 makes sense to me. It's unfortunate that we would have to do that level of work in order to make the damn thing work with the stuff that they say that we have to use, but if each version of TES even on the same chip family is different and if it's puking out unrelated, you know, formats that are different, then it's it's up to us to kind of own the chip and to to deal with the registers directly. If we're going to do that, we may as well just just program it directly, like, you know, like we used to do, <laughs> you know, these, these, these tools are supposed to help. Like this is not supposed to be some sort of obstacle course where we have to prove our loyalty to analog devices or spend a bunch of time farting around with it. It's supposed to be helpful. This is supposed to be a utility. And my attitude, at least over the past year, has been that they are more bed sore than utility, and, and I've gotten pretty grumpy about it. I, and I've told them that that there, there's a, a huge split in analog devices with people that go, "I'm so sorry, these divisions don't talk to each other." We have people that just don't just don't do not have the utility mindset that are not oriented towards the customer. They're often their own thing, and then other people who are like, "Deal with it." Just go get the right, just use the latest version. I don't know what the problem is with you people. So 
it's a as as always the technical part is never the hardest part the hardest part is always kind of the people part and the decisions that they've made about their own products so yeah i think the answer may be that we just simply take ownership of the chip and and go ahead and program it directly and that does mean using tez <laughs> you know maybe to, to as a tiebreaker when we can't figure out what the heck it's doing i, I really do think that these registers are documented um, I printed out like that massive data sheet and put it in a binder for Ken. I think that we do Definitely. have access to that. I think it's very foreseeable though, that we'll come to the point where we have written a hundred registers and it still doesn't work. And we can't reasonably go to analog devices and say, look, we've written these hundred registers. What did we get wrong? And they'll say, well, first of all, you didn't use TES. And then we're stuck. Yeah. I, 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 let me just. It is really interesting discussion, and and I I I really, you know, enjoy the perspective and and want to understand and and learn. I I, I just. It's a little difficult for me. I mean, just a little background. I mean, I've been I've been working in this modem for, uh, in my day job for twenty five years, and it it used to be a sixty four plan modem, and then. Uh, iteration before the current one, it we had it 4,096 clan and over the air, and we've had uh, versions of it. We've made made 10 gigabits per second over the air, you know. And I will tell you, and I, we have deployments anywhere from 10 gigahertz to to 80 gigahertz um, in terms of you know of RF. Now, you know, the RF side, I'm not the, an RF guy, but I'm my I guess my perspective is years and years of doing this and this ADI stuff is just an impediment. We would never have used it. We Okay, used, that's good to know. We use IQ. In fact, a lot of people really avoided IQ because there's um because there's a bunch of impairments that happen in IQ uh if you're doing analog IQ rather. Um and we we solved a lot of those impairments um and have a very successful IQ deployment and doing some other really interesting things. But again, I mean, we do everything's on chip. Uh, in in our it was in our ASICs that we did before, but in the in the FPGA that we do currently, and then we come off either um, uh, baseband uh, um, IQ baseband, or uh, we can come off um, IF even uh, digital IF into the A to D or um, D to A. And so we take care of all the, you know, the mixing on, on in the FPGA um, and all the filtering in the FPGA. And we just, you know, off chip is is dumb A to D's and DAX and mixers um, and or IQ modulators if we're coming off IQ. But I mean, and again, you know, it, it, this has been our architecture and it has served us really well. And you know we don't have any of these problems, and 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 we would have been um, really, uh, you know, this the, one is we wouldn't have wanted to pay, you know, because we're very cost sensitive, so we wouldn't want to pay, you know, for this chip, and we, you know, we weren't getting, we wouldn't be getting enough out of it for what it costs. But again, that's just my perspective and from my industry, right? Um, that doesn't mean it's not the right chip for this design. So, it, you know, I, this is a big learning process for me and it's really good but it, it yeah for me just from where i'm coming from it's like wow we're spending all this time on this right like we could just be knocking stuff out and right and and be doing real you know having real stuff um, right but it costs money or you know it, or time and effort and we don't not everybody has that so you know i, I mean i i'm very aware that that there's lots of reasons to make certain decisions but I, i'm just saying i we would never use this chip <laughs> and like i said we, we've done you know deployments five six gigahertz 20 gigahertz 40 80 um and all with the same modem all with the you know these these uh either iq baseband interfaces or if interfaces with you know simple ADDs, relatively simple ADDs, um and data a's and you know, analog mixers. Right. Yeah, I think you've summarized the situation pretty well. We expected this to be um, utility, uh, to help, 
that would give us a step forward. Uh, I it's, think it's safe to say it hasn't uh, delivered on that promise. So we need we need to really look hard at this and and uh, make some decisions. I think that we can still use what we have, and we also have uh, trends modules. So we also have a really nicely accessible uh, FPGA modules that we can put into the lab that are sitting there waiting to be used. So if we're if we did kind of take a more um, low level approach, uh, wanted to directly address the the FPGAs, we have hardware that can give us even greater access than we have now. Um, to the to the FPGAs that we've targeted, uh, so I think the inventory is on the in the repo. But I'll I'll go ahead and when I summarize this, I'll I'll write up uh, what we have already in stock essentially. Um, and the path on that was that we would be able to knock together something very quickly on the uh, on the dev boards that we have that the you know the ZC seven hundred six and and the ADRV at the time, 9371, that we'd be able to knock together something to, and then work out some of the initial issues and then move to the trends gear. So, and then do custom RF hardware. That was supposed to be the path. Um, and with losing Wally uh, to a very untimely death, that that kind of stopped uh, his his advisory capacity. Uh, but I think his his vision on this was, was good. Um, but that all of us overestimated the value of of having this dev board combo. Um, that it was not we were not supposed to get this bogged down in their issues, and we do currently have uh, gear in the lab that we may be able to shift over to and then start writing the you know doing the things that you're talking about like making progress and and you know taking what we've learned so far all very hard one and and actually getting it deployed um, and then simplifying the the RF side. I'm not very good on RF, not my area. Uh, I know we have people that are much better at picking RF hardware um, and something very straightforward and simple and reliable is probably what we need, especially for any sort of space. Um, we We have organizations that we are very friendly with that can help us either open source satellite um, or the lunar open lunar foundation they have some rf hardware people with some experience that have put stuff in space we're friends with folks that have recently retired from jpl i'm sure rick knows some people uh, des people or or dses people there's some hard rf hardware people there so i'm not too frightened about actually being able to to operate at the frequencies that we're looking at five and ten ten and twenty four 4747 that I'm not as afraid frightened of as 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 I am of the of the unexpected difficulty of getting this to actually work, get on the air in the lab in a reasonable amount of time so I'll I'll summarize what we have in terms of the trends gear and see what it takes to get that accessible from the VMs so that you know we can start working with that uh, as a parallel path and I I do want to be sensitive to Ken, who's put in a lot of time on getting TES under control, and it's been a monumental amount of work. Um, and I would like to continue to work with him on that if he was, seems like he still wants to to do that. And, and I've talked with him a bunch about this, uh, and it's outside of his comfort zone as an ASIC designer, but it, I think he's learned an awful lot and uh, seen, you know, wow, there's, <laughs> there's a lot going on. So I... I think that Michael's point about like we could do a parallel effort and you know that's a whole paper right there to compare and contrast <laughs> these different approaches. You don't really see this sort of um, sort of comparison very often in, in literature these days. Uh, usually that's that's done in house and and not ever really aired publicly. So we have an opportunity to kind of be blunt about the about the capabilities of these abstracted. You know, hardware essentially it's an abstraction layer approach versus getting down and and actually building the design so we have lots of opportunities here and i know we're over time and i know that that matthew has a hard uh limit that he has to go um and i'm i also know that 
Rick has not had a chance to weigh in yet. So Rick, if you have anything to say or ad advice for us before we go ahead and, and close, um, and just a thank you for everybody for staying over time. I apologize for not managing the time a little better. No, uh, I missed a few meetings and so <clears throat> I'm catching up and I'm a little dismayed by what I'm hearing, but not surprised. Uh, and I do have a question. Yeah, <laughs> I understand uh, exactly what you mean. Yeah, I have a question for you unrelated after. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll stay on after we after we close. I'll, I'll, I'll shut down the recording and then we'll we'll hang out later. Okay, so in terms of like a uh, like what I know about uh, Neptune is that we've lots of conversation with Ed Friesma and and a little bit with Talak and a couple of other folks that have popped up. Um, so some some really good signs of life on on Neptune um, and OFDM and well hopefully you'll be seeing plenty more uh, i don't have a date yet on when our two articles are going to come out in qex but i tried very hard to make it friendly and accessible project open for people that want to learn about this particular uh type of technology and and drone communications we do have a the first uh, like official i think meeting uh where we're actually going to talk about the standard for p1954 which is the ieee's drone uh, standard for um, frequency agile, and it sounds like almost tactical formation communications for drones is coming up on the 6th of June. So that's not very long from now, and I'll know a lot more. And um, so if you've already signed up for their mailing list to find out about it, uh, they're very actively recruiting people for that particular standards body. Uh, there's another whole standards body at IEEE for for other types of, of drone communications uh, for the applications, like more applications layer. Uh, and so I put, put that out, I think, on somewhere. The, so the, in terms of like on the regulatory drone side for things that might, might affect our work, uh, that's turned out to be pretty interesting. Um, and then Opulent Voice has had a lot of, a lot of progress. And, and thank you very much to, to Paul for really digging into some of the interesting things that have happened with the timing loops on, on the Opulent Voice implementation. And then uh, Matthew's authorship of, of an enormous quantity of FPGA implementation uh, for minimum shift keying. Uh, and I think we still need to sort out like the, the uh, essentially the sort of the API or the interface between to get this, the flow going. Uh, but it's really very, very close. Uh, so those are some of the other things that are that are going on. So, all right, any last words? Um, open the floor to everybody before we close and then and then go into office hours. All right, thank you, everybody again. and uh, see you see you next week. I will try to have this at ten on Tuesday. Um, but also would love to hear feedback on a different time. Uh, uh, time or day uh, for, for having project meetups that can move around to almost any any day. Uh, we do have some some feedback from, from Anshul, uh, one of our directors who's, who's working on ground station stuff. Uh, so he, I should get a report from him over the next week on, on uh, some progress there. Right, so thank you, everybody. I'll pause the recording here or stop the recording here and uh, see you next week.